Until the lions have their own historians, the tales of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. We are going to delve into a largely overlooked aspect of African history, the trans-Saharan slave trade. It explores the movement of black slaves from inner Africa to North Africa, the Maghreb, highlighting this route as one of Africa's four primary slaving channels. Alongside the infamous Atlantic trade to the Americas, the East Coast trade across the Indian Ocean, and the Nile Valley trade, the Saharan slave trade played a significant role in shaping history. The trans-Saharan slave trade, enduring for many centuries, was as significant as the Atlantic trade in its scale. Unlike the Atlantic route, it disproportionately demanded enslaved women and was characterized by brutal conditions under slave drivers. The introduction of Islam to Africa around 610 CE marked the beginning of a profound transformation. Spearheaded by Arab Muslim expansion and facilitated by traders like the Berbers and Mandi peoples, Islam gradually permeated the continent. Religious figures played a critical role in this process, not only in trade, but also in guiding Muslim communities and teaching Islamic laws. In many African societies, Muslims coexisted with indigenous populations through the principle of enclavement, living peacefully, yet often with restrictions on land ownership and political engagement. Despite their respected status, driven by Arabic and Islamic knowledge literacy, widespread conversion to Islam took time. African societies often viewed religion as an inseparable part of ethnic identity, leading to a nuanced and gradual process of conversion where Islamic culture merged with traditional values. The introduction of jihad in Africa marked a significant shift. Originally a spiritual or armed struggle, it was repurposed to establish Islamic rule and enforce Sharia law. These movements, driven by a desire to purify Islam, often deviated from their spiritual roots, grappling with issues like corruption and the abuse of power. The impact on indigenous communities was profound, resulting in forced conversions and an increase in slavery, reshaping the region's religious and social landscape. Contrary to the glamorized view of the Arab Islamic past in Africa, this era was not a golden age of tolerance and harmony. The influence of Arab Islam was complex, often clashing with and overtaking indigenous systems. While it brought new religious and cultural elements, it also led to significant strife and upheaval, challenging the notion of a harmonious coexistence between Islamic and traditional African values. Absolutely, that the Arab conquest of North Africa was a form of colonization that took place in the seventh century when Arab Muslims burst out of Saudi Arabia and conquered Egypt and went on to conquer the, the whole of North Africa. There were a lot of Berber tribes there. The Egyptian Copts were the original indigenous of the land, as well as the Berbers. And they were all conquered and Islamized and Arabized. Uh, that was also a form of a colonization, definitely. Murzuk, a strategic oasis in the Sahara, was a significant center in the trans-Saharan slave trade up to the mid-19th century. Established in the early 16th century, it linked West and East African slaving routes to North African ports like Tripoli. Despite its harsh, unhealthy location amidst salt marshes, Murzuk thrived due to its role as a primary slave market. Slaves arrived via three main routes, predominantly from Sudan and Lake Chad, enduring brutal conditions. Gadames and Gat were key trading hubs in the trans-Saharan slave trade during the 19th century. Gadames, an ancient oasis in the northern Sahara, functioned as a southwestern desert depot for Tripoli and a southern one for Tunis. Its merchants were renowned throughout Africa for their trade, savvy, and connections operating mostly with the Tuareg people for caravan security and logistics. By the mid-19th century, however, Gadamese merchants limited their travel, relying on networks in Sudanese emporia and speaking Hausa language, a testament to their deep-rooted trading ties. Despite its historical significance, Gadamese experienced a decline in slave trade activity by the late 1840s due to abolitionist efforts in Tunisia and French Algeria, Gat, on the other hand, rose to prominence during this period. Located in the central Sahara, it was a crucial junction for caravans traveling between North Africa and Western Sudan. Offering security and free trade advantages, Gat flourished as a slave market, drawing traders and slaves from vast stretches of central Africa. The town hosted two major trade fairs annually, 
with slaves forming a significant part of the commerce. Trans-Saharan slave trade routes, including the harsh eastern road from the Sultanate of Wadai to Cyrenaica, played a pivotal role in the slave markets of North Africa. This route was especially noted for its difficulty, traversing remote and challenging terrains. Despite this, it became a significant conduit for slave traffic, particularly to places like Augila, an oasis which was a major trading and caravan hub. Slaves from Wadai, often captured across the Islamic pagan frontier in Central Africa, were sought for their labor and sold for considerable profit, despite being perceived as less intelligent and more prone to theft by the Arabs. Despite the inhumane conditions and challenges faced by the slaves during their journey, this trade route remained active well into the 1920s. Absolutely. But slavery was a very important part of Islamic expansion in West Africa, and in fact in the Sudan, and, and from the very earliest period of Islamic uh, penetration into Africa. They, it was it started by uh, uh, buying, purchasing slaves and trading in slaves, and then it went on from purchasing to, uh, to raiding for slaves and capturing slaves uh, deliberately, uh, especially mainly black Africans, uh, and transporting them into the into North Africa and into the uh, uh, into Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula, and on was to the Ottoman Empire to to Turkey. So slavery was a very endemic part of Islamic in interaction with Africa. And in West Africa, the jihad period of the 19th, the 18th and 19th century uh, involved massive uh, slave raiding and slave trading. And many of the slaves that were captured and sent uh, and sold and taken into the, the transatlantic slave trade, uh, most of those who were doing the raiding at the time were Muslim communities. Uh, because they were the dominant tribes. So a lot of that happened. That is not to say that non-Muslim communities were involved in trading, in raiding, but the dominant tribes were the Muslim communities that were doing the raiding at the time. The slave trade from the Sahara to the Mediterranean, especially through Tripoli, was a significant aspect of North African history. Tripoli, for over a thousand years, was a major Mediterranean endpoint for caravans carrying black slaves from the Sahara, particularly from Fezan, and Gadames. The 1840s abolition of slavery in Tunis and Algiers briefly highlighted Tripoli's role in this trade. However, by the late 1850s, European pressure against slavery shifted the focus to Benghazi and other less monitored North African ports, continuing slave shipments to Levantine markets into the 20th century. The transportation of black slaves from North Africa across the Mediterranean, often referred to as the Mediterranean Middle Passage, was a major aspect of the slave trade. The Mediterranean Sea was not always calm and could present significant challenges, especially for small sailing ships journeying from North Africa to the Eastern Mediterranean. These voyages faced navigational difficulties due to the prevailing northwesterly winds and the risk of shipwreck on the coast of the Gulf of Sirte. Islands like Malta and Crete were crucial stopovers for replenishing supplies and occasionally selling slaves. Though shorter and relatively less harsh than the Atlantic Passage, the journey had its own dangers. Overcrowding was common, and supplies were often insufficient for the journey's duration, leading to severe hardships for the slaves. Conditions could rapidly deteriorate in adverse weather, with incidents of disease and death due to confinement and lack of resources. The Mediterranean slave trade was largely confined to Ottoman-controlled areas by the mid-19th century. Although Morocco was a significant market for black slaves, it did not participate in sea-based export, focusing on meeting local demand. Algeria and Tunisia, post-abolition measures, saw a decline in this trade, leaving Tripoli and Egypt as the primary Mediterranean outlets for slave export. Morocco, throughout the 19th century, was the primary market for trans-Saharan slave traders, largely insulated from international abolitionist pressures. Unlike other North African regions, slaves brought to Morocco were not generally re-exported, but absorbed domestically, including in Western Algeria. Morocco's sovereignty at this time was nebulous, extending variably into the Sahara. Slaves, once entering Morocco's sphere, were often sold or integrated into communities along the way, meaning that many never reached the heartland cities like Marrakesh or Fez. 
The number of slaves that began the northbound journey from the Western Sudan was likely higher than those who ultimately arrived in Morocco's core areas. The demand for slaves fluctuated, influenced by varying economic conditions, and slave labor was particularly prevalent in southern Morocco and among nomadic and oasis communities. Estimates of yearly slave imports into Morocco ranged widely, from 500 to several thousand. By the mid-19th century, about half of Morocco's slave demand was met through the Tuat Oasis, which became a significant trading hub due to shifting trade patterns and regional instability. The slave trade into Morocco continued robustly, despite international pressures and regional disruptions. The exact numbers and social impact of this trade remain unclear, partly due to the transient and fluid nature of the Saharan trade routes and the lack of comprehensive historical documentation. The abolition of slavery in North Africa and the trans-Saharan slave trade was a goal shared by many abolitionists, who often assumed that decrees by rulers like the Pasha of Tripoli or the Sultan of Morocco would immediately end these long-standing practices. However, these expectations were unrealistic, as no decree could instantly halt traditions deeply ingrained in society and supported by economic and religious justifications. Efforts by Ottoman authorities in the late 1840s to curb slavery were only marginally effective, often ignored or circumvented, even by state officials. The efforts to end the slave trade highlighted the challenges of eradicating a practice deeply embedded in the social, economic, and cultural fabric of the region. Countries like Libya have been highlighted in recent years for having issues related to human trafficking and forced labor, especially among migrants and refugees. Les chaînes, c'est pour l'esclave qui vient de devenir esclave. Mais l'esclave descendant de plusieurs générations, il est esclave même dans sa tête. Et il est totalement soumis. In other North African countries, while slavery as a legal institution does not exist, there are concerns about practices that resemble slavery or severe exploitation. This is often in the context of migrant labor, domestic servitude, and human trafficking. Mauritania is a country where the issue of slavery has been particularly complex and persistent. Despite officially abolishing slavery in 1981 and making it a criminal offense in 2007, there have been numerous reports indicating that slavery-like practices continue in some parts of the country. In Mauritania, slavery has a long history and is deeply rooted in societal structures. It often occurs in a hereditary context where families of the slave caste are forced to work for families of the master caste without pay or rights. This type of slavery is typically less about the ownership of people in the legal sense and more about entrenched social and economic inequalities. The Mauritanian government has faced criticism from international human rights organizations for not doing enough to combat slavery and for failing to enforce anti-slavery laws effectively. Challenges include deeply ingrained cultural norms, poverty, lack of education, and a judicial system that is often reluctant to prosecute slavery cases. There is a common belief that slaves under Muslim ownership were treated more humanely compared to those in the Western slave trade. However, Dr. Azuma suggests this might not be entirely true. Enslaved people under Muslim owners also faced severe hardships. In the West, such as North America and the Caribbean, African slaves were able to marry and have families, and their descendants are still present in significant numbers today. In contrast, in the Islamic world, the African slave population did not have a similar legacy. This difference is attributed to two main factors, the castration of many enslaved men, which prevented them from having children, and the fact that many female slaves became concubines. Their mixed-race children were often integrated into society, leading to a less distinct African descendant population in the Islamic regions compared to North America. An idealized portrayal of Islamic history in Africa, often perpetuated by Western scholars, impedes honest interfaith and interracial dialogue. The importance of presenting a more accurate and complete history of Africa's past cannot be emphasized enough. This balanced historical perspective is essential for fostering genuine dialogue and understanding among different communities. The Arab world cannot sweep this deplorable chapter of its past and somewhat contemporary history under the rug. 
Kindly consider subscribing and clicking the like button. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section. Thanks for watching.